Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with a news item on page number 11 of the Delhi edition of The Hindu. Election Commission makes fresh push for election reforms. And there are four proposals that we need to discuss. Number one, if you are contesting elections to Lok Sabha, there is a limit to the amount of money that you can spend. There is a cap on your election expense. Let's say 40 lakh rupees. If it's a big constituency, you cannot spend more than 40 lakh rupees on your election campaign. If you do that, ultimately you will be disqualified. Similarly, if you are contesting elections to a big legislative assembly where the constituency size is large, the amount of money that you can spend is 16 lakh rupees. If you are spending more than 16 lakh rupees, you shall be disqualified. But there is no cap or no limit to your election expenses if you are contesting elections to legislative council. That means if you want to become a member of legislative council, there is no limit to the amount of money that you can spend. Election commission wants to put a cap on this expense as well. That's number one. But one thing that is missing in this newspaper article but should be remembered is that election commission in the past has also recommended that there should be a cap, there should be a limit on the amount of money spent by political parties. Because there is a limit to the amount of money that a candidate can spend on an election expense. But there is no limit to the amount of money that political party as a whole can spend on these election campaigns. So there should be a limit to the amount of money spent by political parties, number one. Second, there should be a limit on the amount of money spent by those candidates who want to contest elections to legislative council. That's number one. Number two false declaration now what's a false declaration when you want to contest elections you have to file an affidavit when you are submitting your nomination papers in this affidavit you declare that these are the criminal cases pending against me this is the amount of property in my name and in the name of my spouse this is my educational qualification so on and so forth but what if you make a false declaration in your election affidavit? If you make a false declaration in your election affidavit, it is an offense. But for this offense, the jail term is six months. And we know if a member of parliament or a member of legislature is sentenced to a jail term of less than two years, he or she cannot be disqualified from being the member of that house. So what the election commission is now demanding, it is demanding that if a candidate makes a false declaration in his election affidavit, then he should be disqualified. That means this false declaration should be classified as an electoral offense, not just as a penal offense. That's number two. Number three, bribery is an offense. It's a crime. But there are two types of offenses broadly. An offense can be either cognizable offense or an offense can be non-cognizable as well. What is the difference? In a non-cognizable offense, if you have committed an offense without the court order, the police cannot arrest you, the police cannot start investigation in your offense. That's number one. But if it's a cognizable offense, then the police does not need a court warrant for you to be arrested or to start an investigation into your alleged offense. What election commission is now asking that bribery during the election process, because bribery is a non-cognizable offense, but during the election process, bribery should be declared as a cognizable offense so that the police can arrest an individual without a court warrant and can start investigation without the court orders. That's number three. Number four, election commission of India consists of chief election commissioner, and not more than four election commissioners. That's the law as it stands today. How can a chief election commissioner be removed? A chief election commissioner is removed in the same manner and on the like grounds as the judge of a Supreme Court. 
that means the chief election commissioner will be removed on the grounds of proved misbehavior or incapacity and for a judge of the supreme court to be removed a resolution should be passed in both houses of the parliament that too by special majority that means in order to remove chief election commissioner chief election commissioner can be removed on the grounds of proved misbehavior and incapacity and he can be removed by the president of india only on the basis of the resolution passed by both houses of the parliament that too by special majority but how can election commissioners be removed election commissioners can be removed only on the recommendation of chief election commissioner that means in order to remove election commissioner you don't need parliamentary approval you don't need resolution of both houses of the indian parliament chief election commissioner will recommend to the president and president can remove these election commissioners but the recommendation of chief election commissioner is not binding on the president of india if the chief election commissioner recommends that this election commissioner should be removed from the election commission but president may or may not order the removal of this election commissioner but now what election commission is recommending that these election commissioners should also be removed in the same manner as chief election commissioner is removed that means on the basis of the resolution passed by both houses of the indian parliament that too by special majority these are the four proposals given by election commission of india one that there should be a cap on election expenses for a candidate who is contesting election to legislative council second if a candidate is making a false declaration it should be treated as an election offense and that candidate should be disqualified from being the member of that house third bribery during the election process should be declared as a cognizable offense so that without a court warrant the police can arrest that individual and start investigation into that offense and fourth just the way in which chief election commissioner is removed in the same manner election commissioner should also be removed by the president on the basis of the resolution passed by both houses of the parliament that too by special majority but there are two more things that we need to understand number 1 the administrative ministry for the election commission is the law ministry that means these proposals will be forwarded to the law ministry law ministry will then take these proposals before the cabinet once the cabinet clears these proposals then there will be bills in the parliament and after the bills are passed in the parliament then these proposals will come into effect that's number 1 This article talks about that chief election commissioner can be removed from the office only through impeachment by parliament but impeachment is a wrong word to be used here under the constitution of india impeachment is used only under article 61 of indian constitution that deals with the removal of the president of india that means only the president of india is impeached from his office all other individuals whether it is cag chief election commissioner upsc chairperson all these individuals are removed from their offices they are not impeached but in common man's language we use impeachment for judges chief election commissioner as well but legally the term should have been removal rather than impeachment because impeachment is only used for the president of india under article 61 of indian constitution that is all that you need to know regarding this newspaper article let's look at another news on page number 3 relevant for your prelims pangolin but pangolins we have discussed in detail sometimes back but for those who have just joined us those who are watching this video for the first time let me give you a brief background of who these pangolins are this is how a pangolin looks like it's not a reptile it looks like a lizard but basically a pangolin is a mammal and they are the only mammals in the world who are wholly covered in scales look at these scales and they use these scales to protect themselves from predators how if this pangolin is under threat then what a pangolin does the pangolin will immediately curl itself into a tight ball and then they will use these sharp scales to defend themselves there are eight species of pangolin in the world but where are these pangolins found 
they are found only in tropical asia and sub saharan africa so there are in total eight species of pangolins but they are only found in tropical asia and in sub saharan africa and there are two species of pangolins that are found in india one indian pangolin and the second chinese pangolin and what is the iucn status of these pangolins critically endangered now let us look at some of the facts regarding these pangolins number 1 these pangolins are harmless important statement for your prelims number 2 they are nocturnal active during the night but there are some species of pangolins which some researchers say they are diurnal that means active during the day as well third they do not have teeth fourth their tongue is longer than their body and what they do they eat ants and termites so that means ecologically they are also very significant for farmers and their scales they are made up of keratin and one more important statement these pangolins they have poor vision and normally they are poached because of two reasons one because of their scales which are made up of keratin and two because of their meat its meat is considered to be very tasty and in high demand in countries such as china and vietnam where the meat cost is very huge as well but these pangolins they are covered under cites convention on international trade in endangered species and also these pangolins are mentioned in india's laws for example wildlife protection act of 1972 both these species of pangolins are protected under wildlife protection act of 1972 and if you trade in these pangolins you kill them there is a penalty of 3 to 7 years a fine of more than 10000 rupees as well that is something that you need to know regarding this newspaper article now let's look at another news article on page number 4 relevant for your gs paper 2 villages in india they are facing problems such as poverty illiteracy lack of skills health care for example and these are the problems that cannot be tackled individually but can be better solved through group efforts that means group of people coming together solving their problems and that is where we get an idea about self help groups sags let me put it differently women's empowerment is critical to development since the beginning of five year plans emphasis was given for the development of women but the strategy was different the first four five year plans what they viewed women as they viewed women as beneficiaries that means more and more welfare schemes should be started for women because women are beneficiaries of the state but from fifth five year plan onwards the policy changed towards women and the policy makers focused on the development of women through education through literacy so that we can treat these women as human resource therefore from fifth five year plan onwards we started treating women not as beneficiaries but as partners of growth as partners of development this is where the idea of the self help group gained currency the first organized initiative was textile labor association of ahmedabad the year was 1954 what happened this textile labor association of ahmedabad it formed its women's wing and who were the members of this women's wing mill workers who were working in this textile industry their family members their women so their women were trained in primary skills such as sewing knitting embroidery stenography for example the objective was that these women should be trained in such a manner skills should be imparted to them in such a manner that they become self reliant they become economically independent then came 1972 in 1972 ila but she started an initiative called seva and what is seva self employed women's association what she did she organized women workers such as 
hawkers, vendors, papad makers, agarbati makers, manual laborers, so on and so forth. What was her objective? Her objective was that these women who come from marginalized sections of the society, disempowered sections of the society, we should increase their income. We should increase their assets. Not only that, we should enhance their food requirements. We should enhance their nutritional standards as well. That means if they will have more money in their hands, they will invest this money to raise, to enhance the nutritional standards of their families as well. And the objective was also that this group of women should be provided training in such a manner that they assume leadership roles tomorrow. And this is how the Seva experiment was then taken forward in states such as Tamil Nadu, Kerala, so on and so forth. So what is this self-help group basically? Self-help group is a small voluntary association of poor people. Preferably if these poor people are from the same socio-economic background. And they come together for the purpose of solving their common problems. How? Let's say this is a group of women. Normally the group of women does not exceed 20. So let's say 10 to 20 members. So these women, they may be Anganwadi workers, they may be papad makers, they may be agarbati makers, they may be household maids. What they will do, they will start earning, but they will pool their savings in a fund. Small savings, 200 rupees, 300 rupees, 500 rupees. They will start saving some part of their money and they will deposit the savings in a fund. So that tomorrow, if any woman in this group would need money, then what she will do? She will approach this fund and she will get the loan from this fund. But the beautiful thing about this is that how this fund will be managed entirely by women. What should be the interest rate that should be paid by this woman who is asking for loan from this fund? That will be determined by this woman. How this fund will be managed, what percentage of this fund can be given out as loan will be managed by the women entirely. That means this self-help group number one, it will empower and train women in such a manner that they will assume leadership of this fund and they will manage their resources effectively. That's number one. Number two, Previously, women were deprived of loans by the banks because banks would ask for collateral. The banks would ask for collateral and in absence of the collateral, no loans were made available for the women. Now they would keep this fund as a collateral and against this collateral, the loan and credit will be made available to the women. That means the idea of this self-help group was to increase the the income and assets of the women. The idea was that they should become self-sufficient, self-reliant, economically independent and at the same time they should come under this credit system of the banks as well. Former RBI governor Dr. Raghuram Rajan said we should provide more and more loans to women because they are less likely to default on their payments. One more important thing. In 1992, the self-help groups were promoted when these self-help groups were linked with bank linkage program and this was the program started by Nabad. The objective was that rural poor's access to formal credit system should be made in a sustainable manner with the help of these self-help groups and we are seeing the success here as well. Financial freedom because of these self-help groups helps women in Pune villages and they have turned into entrepreneurs. So two organizations, Ernst and Young Foundation and Srinivasan Services Trust, which is the social services arm of TVS Motors. These two organizations have been empowering women by setting up self-help groups in over 100 villages in Pune district. And ultimately, this financial freedom has helped women to turn entrepreneurs. So whenever question about self-help group success story is asked in the examination, this is one example that you can cite in your answers. Now let's look at another newspaper article on page number 7. If you look at gross enrollment ratio of the students admitted in schools, this gross enrollment ratio tells us that the number of boys 
and girls at the secondary level is more or less equal we have equal number of boys and girls at the secondary level in our school system and girls they remain in education system for a longer period but despite the fact that literacy levels in women have increased but we are not seeing any rise in the working women despite the fact that high literacy levels are there what are the reasons a study was published in indian council for research on international economic relations icrier this report talks about four factors why this is happening number 1 women are getting more and more access to education but principal reason why they are not getting access to the job market is that they get education so that they can get good matching or marriage proposals in the marriage market that means higher the qualification of a women better the marriage prospects so their intention is not that we will seek more education because we have to enter into the job market but the families are allowing the girl child to study more to apply for more educational degrees the principal reason is that if they have more degrees good educational qualification they will get better proposals in the marriage market that's number 1 number 2 the other problem is the social norms in india there is much acceptability or social acceptability given to those families where women are given education but this women is not allowed to work in the job market that means higher prestige or social status is associated with families which keep their women out of the workforce that's the second reason why this is happening third poor condition for educated women fourth the quality of education is also bad and that is why we are not seeing the rise of this working women in the job market despite the fact that they have high literacy levels so what this report says that there should be behavioral change behavioral change so that programs should be organized in such a manner that it should acknowledge that child care is the responsibility of both the parents not just of the female child but also for a male member of the family both are equally responsible for the growth and development and care giving for the child but we also need to understand although this report does not talk about this but we need to understand the ill effects of the maternity benefit law as well although this is a recent law but already people are talking about the negative impact of this maternity benefit law on the working women how maternity benefit law talks about that a women employee will be paid 26 weeks of leave that means it will be a paid maternity leave that too for two children and this is having negative impact on the employability factor for a woman for example if i am a recruiter i have to recruit five people and in the interview there are let's say 100 people who are looking for a job i see that there are five talented women in this group of 100 people who should ideally be given this job opportunity because they are talented they are smart and they better meet the requirements of this job but these five women talented women are in the fertile reproductive age as well so i think twice that tomorrow they will marry and when they will marry they will also start planning for their family and i have to pay them 26 weeks of paid maternity leave and it will be a loss for my company because i have to support them for 52 weeks for their two children so instead of hiring these five talented women i opt for five men who are less talented than these five women so ultimately this maternity benefit law is also having a negative impact on the employability of a woman so what is the reform required invest in different european countries also maternity leave paid maternity leave is provided to the women employees but this burden is shared by the government and the private employer but in india this burden is entirely to be borne by this private employer so this private employer will not employ a woman and instead will employ a less qualified or less talented man 
this is where the government should step in and share the burden of this private employer so that more and more employment opportunities are made available to a women and this maternity benefit law also has a patriarchal bias women are paid 26 weeks of paid maternity leave but a man is paid 7 days of paternity leave the intention is or the implication is the inherent implication is that the responsibility of raising the child is that of a woman not that of a man so this is something that needs to be changed this patriarchal mindset of our lawmakers need to be changed that is what this iCareer study talks about we need to have programs that acknowledge child care as the responsibility of both parents that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article let's look at another news on page number 11 Prime Minister Modi announces new award for national unity and this award will be along the same lines as that of Padma Awards Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan, Padma Shri and this award will be given annually to any Indian who has contributed to national unity in any manner but we don't know yet what this award will be called what are the requirements of this award when this award will be launched so on and so forth but once these details are known it will become an important potential question for your prelims examination that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article now let us look at some of the editorials and columns from today's newspaper beginning with what is altruistic surrogacy written by Anindita Majumdar this basically talks about the recent surrogacy bill passed by the Lok Sabha where commercial surrogacy was banned and instead altruistic surrogacy was allowed this column basically is a mix it praises some of the points mentioned in this bill and also criticizes other points that are there in the bill let's look at both one by one first the question that she raises is what is altruistic surrogacy for example here is a couple who is not in a position to deliver a child to conceive a baby they approach another woman and this woman acts as a surrogate mother she carries the fertilized embryo for nine months carries the baby for nine months but the question Anindita Majumdar writes is what is so altruistic about this what is so selfless about this when this surrogate mother relinquishes her child after nine months so what is so altruistic about this for example in Australia altruism is that this surrogate mother is the legal mother of the child but then this child can be transferred to this couple through a process called adoption or through legal means that is altruism in Australia but in India we say commercial surrogacy is banned this altruistic surrogacy can be allowed that too by a close relative that means this surrogate mother should be a close relative but how this is where Ms. Majumdar praises one important requirement in this bill this surrogacy bill talks about that we should train this surrogate mother that you are only a gestate mother you are not the legal mother you are only a gestate mother you only have a job of keeping this fertilized embryo inside your womb for nine months and then you have to relinquish this child it does not mean that you are the legal mother or legitimate mother of this child you are only a gestate mother so that is a clause that is praised by Ms. Majumdar in this in this surrogacy bill but second when we talk about this close relative this is where the problem is because this close relative is not defined in this surrogacy bill let's look at it this way you are already married you have a child you have number of children for example but your sister-in-law is not in a position to conceive in this case what will happen your family will force you to act as a surrogate mother for your sister-in-law's embryo and this talks about exploitation in a country like India where women does not have a voice inside their family this position of close relative or this clause of close relative can be exploitative against women now let's look at another problem commercial surrogacy is banned that means a woman will not be paid anything except insurance cover or medicines so on and so forth 
but what can also happen dowry is also banned in india but even then we see dowry is exchanged every now and then similar thing can happen with surrogacy as well where this close relative will be paid commercial benefits but we will hide these commercial benefits from the from the law enforcers so this commercial surrogacy will not be eradicated because of this clause called close relative on top of that there is another problem transplantation of humans organs act 1994 it prohibits donating organ when you are alive but you can donate this organ to near relatives so near relatives is similar to this concept called close relative but what we have seen with this transplantation of humans organ act how do we identify close relative because this identification of close relative will take on a murky turn just like in case of organ donation wherein strangers were dressed up as near relatives in altruistic surrogacy similar negotiations can be entered into and in a patriarchal society such as india women are always at the receiving end of exploitation and we have to be very wary of the kind of exploitation we are fostering that is what this column talks about but this column also talks about the negatives for example gay couples cannot opt for surrogacy single men and women cannot opt for surrogacy living couples cannot opt for surrogacy so these are very regressive things that are talked about in this bill but there are some other clauses in this bill that miss majumdar praises for example number 1 the push for adoption that's a welcome thing in this bill second in vitro fertilization or other assisted reproductive technologies they have become very popular of late now what happens because of the popularity of ivf and art other assisted reproductive technologies the couples have problematic definition of infertility that means they are in a relationship for a year married relationship for a year two years three years and they are not able to conceive a child and they think of themselves as infertile and they then opt for ivf and art but this column says that for a variety of reasons a couple may not be in a position to conceive a child that does not necessarily mean that they may be infertile they may take a slightly longer time to conceive a child and that is why this push that a couple should be married for 5 years then they can opt for surrogacy is a welcome thing in this bill that is what you need to understand from this newspaper column now let's look at another editorial capital idea on friday we talked about how the center has sought parliament's approval for additional 41000 crore so that this 40000 crore recapitalization plan of the government it will be injected into the banks so that the banks will have more money to lend the objective is that there are close to 11 banks under pca framework prompt corrective action RBI has placed these banks under PCA because they are not generating enough profit because their financial management is poor because their non performing assets are increasing and the central government hopes that this 41000 crore or total 83000 crore that will be spent by the government this year on bank recapitalization this money is given to these banks so that these banks can come out of this prompt corrective action but this editorial sends a word of caution to the government that this money should be spent on only those banks which have shown some corrective action which have shown some element of profitability which have shown some element of financial management because there are reports that alabad bank bank of india corporation bank and bank of maharashtra they will soon come out of this pca but out of these four banks only corporation bank and bank of maharashtra they have shown some financial stability they have shown some profit they have shown that their asset quality has increased the other two banks are still on the recovery path so we should not waste this money in an election year on those banks which are very weak but we should spend this money on those banks which have shown some element of recovery and that is where the government has to exercise some prudence and caution because this editorial says recapitalization is not a bad idea 
infusing more money into the banks is not a bad idea at all but a lot depends on how and to which banks this money will be distributed that is what this editorial is all about now let's look at another column on page number nine water woes india can't afford to ignore the water crisis neither can south asia nor the world water scarcity is a clear and present danger and global warming is something that is heightening this threat niti ayog released a report this year wherein it said that 600 million people in india are facing acute water shortage 2 lakh people die each year because they do not have access to clean water by the year 2020 21 cities in india will run out of ground water and a decade from now india will lose 6 percent of its gdp because of the water crisis when this report by niti ayog was released there were lot many television debates lot many articles in newspaper columns but now this hue and cry this report is largely forgotten the attention has died down a new research has been released by researchers from united states and south asia what this report finds out that if we have brahmaputra and river indus and we have river ganga three fourth of the water flow to brahmaputra and indus is because of snow melt melting of snow similarly nearly half of the river flow in ganga is because of the snow melt but in the coming years global warming will lead to higher temperatures and less snow that means if it leads to less snow that means the flow of water into brahmaputra and indus as well as into ganga will reduce and this will have implications for the economic growth and public health in india as well as in south asia the demand for water will increase but on top of that what we should also be looking at we should embrace water saving technologies so what this column talks about that water should not only become a political issue or an election issue but it should also become an existential issue so that our lives are saved our economy is on a recovery path now let us look at some of the prelims based question from today's paper which of the following statements are correct sashastra seema bal was set up in 1963 yes SSB is under the administrative control of Ministry of Defense. No, it is under the control of MHA, Home Affairs. SSB guards the Indo-Nepal and Indo-Bhutan border. Yes. Which of the above statements are correct? One and three are correct. Why this news? Look at the context. In today's newspaper, this news report is there. SSB gears up to tackle floods. Map based question, which of the following statements regarding Indonesia are correct because of the tsunami in Indonesia, which has led to loss of hundreds of people. Indonesia shares land borders with three countries, Malaysia, Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea. Yes, the country is positioned on the equator. Both the statements are correct. Look at the map. Indonesia here on the equator. And this is New Guinea. This is Timor. This is Malaysia. Previous year's prelims based question, which of the following gives global gender gap index? It is the World Economic Forum. Now let's look at a mains based question. Answer should be in less than 200 words. Saragisi bill reflects shallow understanding of women and desire for children. Comment. When we discuss the Saragisi column, we praise some of the provisions in this bill. But now we'll have to criticize this bill because that is the demand of the question. Number one husband and wife they know that they are infertile but surrogacy bill says you have to wait for five years before you can opt for surrogacy why should a childless couple wait for five years and then opt for surrogacy that's problem number one husband and wife they are married for five years they do not have a child and they can opt for surrogacy clear yes but if they have a child, even then they can opt for surrogacy, provided this child is disabled. This speaks volumes about the gross attitude of our lawmakers towards the disabled children. 
that means we have a desire for a normal child in this country what will happen to this disabled child after this couple has had another child out of surrogacy won't this dis disabled child be neglected in the family that's another problem with this bill transsexuals same sex couples live in relationship partners single mothers single fathers they are not allowed to opt for surrogacy that again is a retrograde provision in this bill but the biggest problem is when this husband and wife they opt for surrogacy that too from a close relative this is where the biggest problem lies this close relative as i have discussed previously wherein a sister in law can force you to opt as a surrogate mother for her child in a country like india where women does not have a right over her reproductive health where a woman does not have the right or voice inside the family this clause of close relative can be deeply exploitative against the women that's another problem but if this is a close relative she can act as a surrogate mother for the husband and the wife do you know what this surrogate mother should already be married but why what is the logic it is it reflects the shallow understanding of a woman on top of that this married surrogate mother has to seek the permission of her husband why when we talk about women's empowerment why is it that this surrogate woman has to seek her husband's permission then she can apply for surrogacy then she can rent her womb that's another problem but what is so altruistic in this surrogacy imagine the burden the mental trauma the physical damage that a woman has to go through when she delivers a child all that is neglected in the surrogacy bill because what we demand from this woman is altruism selflessness what is selfless about a woman who rents her womb for 9 months and relinquishes her child so this surrogacy bill reflects shallow understanding of women and the desire for children that is what you need to write in your answer and that is it from our newspaper analysis today thank you for being with us have a great day